We then went on to last event, which was Long Beach. Anybody watch that race? Okay. You know, I, I was really looking forward to, to that event for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's a street race, and there's always a lot of action and always a lot of mixing it up there. But as that week progressed, it looked like the weather was going to be bad, which Danny and I talked, and for all the years we've been going out there together, I don't ever remember a single day of rain, ever, ever. And that's a long, long time. Well, it rained the whole time we were there. The first dry lap around that racetrack was the pace lap. Nobody got any race laps. And starting in the four car was Antonio, who, by the way, had never been to Laguna or had never been to Palm Beach in his life. But he hadn't seen the thing except in the rain. And then, you know, the battle back and forth. We knew we had an advantage because when we take him off the truck, with our advanced simulation programs and all our history, I think it gives us a huge advantage, and I think it proved true uh, at that event. We, uh, we, we kind of, I don't want to say we dominated, but we were quite confident we were going to do well, and right from the opening gun line, it looked that way. Dan, you want to share a couple of your insight into the Beach? Yeah, we, uh, we show up there. Antonio's obviously never been there. He gets uh, four laps in the wet. They call practice. So, the, like you said, the first time we run it and it's dry, we actually do the recon lap where we go out of the pits and then line up on the front straightaway. And they gave us 10 minutes, so we did three laps. Those are the three laps that he got. And uh, you're asking a guy to go, you know, 170 miles an hour into turn one, and he's never done that before. So, uh, it was pretty exciting. We banged up the three car on the start there where everybody started running to each other, but uh, they both did an amazing job. Ian, you know, took a car that was really injured. It didn't look that bad on TV, but it was really smashed up. Uh, when the hood flew off and all that, it really hurt the downforce, so um, we were able to get that car to fourth, and uh, Tommy and Oliver just did an amazing job. Tommy did a great job staying out of trouble on that. He could have easily been in that. He took it a little bit easy in turn one, and it paid off for him because he wasn't in the wreck, and, uh, and uh, Oliver does what he does best when it's time to go. He was ready, and uh, kind of made them all look a little silly, and uh, yeah, that's exciting for, for us. Last year we struggled, and this year the new car, the wider car, uh, bigger front tires, just makes a huge difference, and we're able to race, uh, and that's what we love to do. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just in my few minutes here this morning, uh, I had several people come up with questions directly related to racing, so we're going to spend a serious amount of time answering those questions because I think it's, it's something, they were very good questions, the, the two or three that I heard this morning. But I, by way of background, as we go forward, there's, there's new rules this year. If you recall last year, the way that the field was laid out, we ran at a distinct disadvantage to the other three brands, the BMW, the Ferrari, and the Porsche. And that was pretty much by design. The sanctioning body made it clear to us that they did not want us coming into uh, a new level of GT series and just dominating as we did in GT1. And uh, we, un we understood that. And, and, and we're here for the long term. So, you know, it, it became apparent that it was going to be to our own benefit in the long run if we sacrificed a season and, and learn what we could learn from it and take our lumps. And then we had their assurance that at the end of that year they would reevaluate the rule situation and there would be some adjustments. And we took them at their word because we've had a, a long and good relationship with them. And, and they did that. The gentleman that, that, uh, that looks and evaluates the rules package uh, is a, man, a German guy by the name of Norbert Singer. Those of you that follow road racing know that for virtually a lifetime, Norbert uh, was responsible for all Porsche racing worldwide. And I've known the guy personally for a long, long time. He is an honorable, fair, uh, a great guy, and, and a racer at heart. He evaluated all the data submitted by all the companies and all the data that the series collected. And at the end of that day, uh, it, it became pretty clear that you know we had pretty much got screwed, <laughs> which we knew. So at the follow-up uh, ACO meeting, uh, this came out, we have a manufacturer's meeting four times a year. And he pretty much laid it out and, and said it in essentially those exact words, you know. And, and as I recall, the quote was, as you all know, we have screwed Corvette for the past year. He says, we're going to make some changes that are going to level the playing field so you all better be ready to race. 
and, and they've done that. And, and what they did was they, they took away four tenths of a millimeter on the BMW restrictor. All right, so that BMW has been throttled back a little bit. They took some weight off the Porsche because Porsche wasn't figuring into too much of the fray. Uh, for some reason, they gave Ferrari a new rear wing. I, I don't know what, what that was about yet because it wasn't discussed in the meeting, so we're going to find out more about that when we get to our next event. And for us, they allowed us to raise our wing a little bit, which is uh, of dramatic help, and they increased our restrictor by four-tenths of a millimeter. So we're able to develop a little additional power. In addition to that, for everybody, the Ferrari was always two inches wider, and I won't get into why that was, but it was something we all agreed upon. But now the, the Porsche can be wider, the BMW can be wider, although it isn't, and the Corvette can be wider, which it is, two inches wider, which makes a huge difference in the way the car works. So when you add up those three big chunks of thing, the, the, the wing, the restrictor, and the wider car, our performance now is much more closely matched. Uh, they still think that they've kept us back just a little bit, and that's, you know, to make sure that they don't screw up. But I think that uh, at the end of the day, and, and I think uh, both Sebring and Long Beach indicated, now we have a car that we can actually go out and race. We don't have to be totally dependent upon uh, strategy and pit stop execution and good fortune. We can, we can actually go race head to head with them. And uh, it, it, Long Beach, I think, really was, was uh, exemplified that when you saw how well the car handled, how well the car braked. Um, it's made a huge difference. The engineering staff has worked really, really hard on that. And I think we're able to leverage those, uh, those uh, advantages now to the point where we're going to uh, be able to compete on a regular basis. Laguna will be the test. Anyone want to talk about, a little about our history at Laguna? Yeah, our history at Laguna is not terrific. Um, the place is usually cold. It's really dirty. A lot of dust and dirt, the way they change the track around. And uh, it's very hard to get a hold of the track. We use the softest tires that additional brings. Uh, Lee here is here somewhere. Please bring us the softest tires. <laughs> All softly. No hard's necessary. <laughs> um, it's just very hard to get a hold of. And uh, our history there is uh, just fighting to get that better and better. And our engineering staff, Doug Laus and his group, have been working really hard to assure me that we're going to have great cars when we unload there. Um, the drivers do an awesome job. You remember the year the Yan raced there and with the Porsche, and uh, unfortunately we didn't win there. But uh, uh, we're going to give it our best, just like we always do, and uh, hopefully at the end we can win one there. We haven't been able to do that for a while, and uh, we're going to try our best. And uh, Yan needs to get a win there because that last deal where he tore that car up that was uh, that was rough for the whole team. So. I think the thing uh, that's a little bit different this year too at the Moon is we've got a, a six-hour event. And, and we tend to excel at races that uh, are of extended duration. And that's due to the durability, reliability of the Corvette, and obviously uh, steadfastness of our, our pit crew, our drivers have experience in that. So I'm, quite frankly, looking forward to the six hours, because we're going to see, obviously, a weather change. It's going to get, you know, those of you who have spent some time out in that area of the country know that there's a marine layer that comes in usually in the afternoons. So there can be quite uh, dramatic temperature swings. It can be 85, 90 degrees during the day, and it can move quickly to 50 degrees at night. So uh, you have to be able to be able to react and adapt to those situations. We have the experience to do that. So I'm, I'm quite excited about it. Six hours is a is is, is actually pretty for endurance racing. Six hours is the is the perfect time for me. You know, it's enough to get your interest. You can hold it for the six hours. It's not so long that you're trying to go to sleep. You know, you're not having to battle that fatigue factor that we all do. You know, 12 hours is, uh, is pretty hard. The fortunate part about Sebring, 12 hours is we start early in the morning. We start at 10 a.m. So you get done at 10, so you still get some bar time after the race is over. <laughs> that works out really, really well. So you can imagine the, the, the Laguna thing, only six hours. Perf I can actually go home and get cleaned up before I go to the bar. <laughs> All right, with that, let's open up for questions. I know I had a couple. Yep, we're going to work here. sort of uh, as light as it could be, big tires, you know, no extras, basically, with GT1, uh, 1,000 kilograms. 
um, and then it was 1,100 kilograms. So uh, basically, the lightest, quickest, baddest race car you can make. When it switched to DT2, it was more production based. We used more of the chassis. Um, we actually used the aluminum chassis, which is the first time that we've actually done that. Uh, the car weighs uh, 1,245 kilograms, so quite a bit heavier. Um, they make us use like some of the trunk pieces, they make us use a lot more of the window frame, they make us use a lot of the production pieces where it adds weight to the car. And uh, they didn't like our 7 liter engine in GT2, we, we went to a 6 liter, they still didn't like that. <laughs> so now we're 5.5 liters and it seems like that's balanced out pretty good with the other competitors. Um, but then, and that's being said, the new Viper is going to be able to run an 8 liter engine. So, um, well, we don't know that for sure. That's what they're telling us. That's what Viper's so, telling us. Yeah, right. That's what they're trying to tell they, us. They don't have a car that's approved or homologated yet. They don't even have a race car built. So, put that in perspective. Right. I know so, that'll come up. So, we're going to put the pressure on Doug to make sure they don't show up with an 8 liter engine. So, yeah. uh, but, um, anyways, uh, those are the things that have changed. Um, like I said, the car's uh, about 300 pounds heavier, smaller engine, uh, basically the same size tires. Uh, we use iron or steel brakes, and then the GT1 car used uh, carbon fiber brakes. Um, the size of the wing and the size of the underwing and the front are about half the size, so the arrow is less. Um, we're getting closer to that number that we've been testing a lot. Uh, in fact, on uh, Tuesday, on Wednesday, sorry, we were at Oscola, Michigan, testing the GT2 car and the Le Mans trim. So we're working really hard with the aero stuff to make the GT2 car better, and uh, we're making some good strides. To give you an idea how far I've come, first of all, those that think like the new GT class is less sophisticated than what the GT1 was are absolutely wrong. From a technical standpoint, you have to work twice as hard because of the way they've added content to the vehicle. But, but Dan will remember, I mean, I, I can remember taking the GT1 car down to Sebring and how hard we worked to, to run a sub two minute lap. When we broke that two minute barrier at Sebring, I mean, we were all smiles, okay? I, I, we were rate with a hundred less horsepower and 250 more pounds. We were racing at laps at 158 and 159. A hundred less horsepower and 250 pounds more. We were going faster than that that moment in time when we broke through with the GT1 car. That tells you how far we've come and how much better the car's got. That's an amazing fact. That answer your question. Yes, sir. Thank cool. you. Way in the back corner, and then we'll work our way down. All right. Really enjoy your web uh, videos uh, of uh, you guys racing and the development of your car. I wonder how much interaction you guys have with the factory and, and what concrete impacts you've had on the current car. Well, we never use the term concrete impact. <laughs> But I, but, I, but, I, but I think the fact that, that Taj got, got up first, and, and you heard the words that, that he used. You know, we're going to get we're going to get some feedback from our, 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 our buddies down the street in Detroit, who are coming out with their brand new Viper, which, by the way, look kind of just like the brand new old Viper. I couldn't. I couldn't I decided I couldn't understand the big deal. They introduce this thing in Geneva. Everybody makes it a new Viper. And it looked just like the old one to me. <laughs> Essentially, I don't think it's, uh, there's a whole lot changed in it. But you know, it's a, it's a it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting world in which we live. When you can pretty much say anything you want to say on the internet, Dodge is going to, and I begin, begin believe they have begun to say that you know the story we're talking about, technology transfer, blah blah blah, is just so much talk, hot air, that it doesn't really happen. Well. You guys own Corvettes, you come to the racetrack, you see what you've had, you know how the things have progressed. I, I'm guessing you believe what we're saying. Anybody here not believe that, that what we do in the race car finds its way back into the street car? I mean, when you look at materials and, 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 and the, huge, the huge deal with flush fit headlamps and the aerodynamic packages and the splitters and spoilers and the, and the large displacement small block engine, I mean, I don't know how anybody could say that, that, that it isn't. Because we talk between the two groups literally on a daily basis. And that has only intensified and been magnified on the development 
of the new Y1 car. I mean, that has become of paramount importance. When was I there? When I there table table? Last week or a week before? When we had the group down there? I mean, we're not even just talking back and forth. We're physically visiting back and forth, touching, feeling, smelling, all the things that we need to do to ensure the fact that the next level of product that comes out is even more representative of what we learned in racing. And, and I think when, when, when you see that, you, you'll, you'll believe it. And, and the guys who are out there going to tell that story that it's just so much smoke we're trying to blow up somebody's skirt, they're, they're, they're going to be pretty humble and they're going to have to eat crow because it's, it's going to become even more apparent than it is. We talk literally on a daily basis. The technology transfer is real. It's continuing and growing stronger every day. Good answer to your question. Yes. All right, right down here, red shirt. I'm going to defer yeah. to my okay. we, we live very close to VIR, so we're real happy right now. I can tell just by the way you said that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are you, if and when will you get any practice laps there? And just give us your thoughts about coming to VR, which is naturally uh, a great history for that history racetrack. Well, we're super excited to get to go there. Um, we haven't tested there yet, but we're waiting for the weather to get a little bit better, and we're going to go down there and run some um, great, great racetrack, super fast, fits our car, terrific. Um, the LMS is going to be there for the first time, September 15th, I think it is, and uh, it'll be exciting. Um, like I said, it's super fast, and uh, we haven't been in that part of the world, so we're hoping that the fans, you know, will uh, show up and bring their Corvettes, so I'm sure most of you will be there, but uh, that we're really looking forward to that. Should be pretty exciting because it's a, it, for, for the most part, really quick, and you have to really pick your, well in this case, spot to pass. Passing's really difficult at that racetrack, so it's going to be a very, very interesting event. With the, combine the speed with the, uh, with the relative uh, narrow characteristics of that, of that raceway, it's going to be... We're looking forward to it. We always like going to new venues because it, once again, it gets back to how well you have them prepared when you take them off the truck. And we think that should work to our advantage. So uh, we're quite excited. And it is a beautiful place. Thank you. You bet. Let's go over here. Yeah, uh, I've noticed uh, went to Sebring and thoroughly enjoyed uh, spending the time there with the Corvette race team and, and the race. <laughs> No, I think I think your I think your observations are, are pretty much spot on. Uh, a couple things going on there, uh, not the least of which is as part of the rule change for this year. Last year you could make one change during the course of the year, and that's all they would implement. This year they can change it. They, being the sanctioning body, can change anything at any one time. So it's very, very important if you think you have some kind of advantage that you might want to manage that advantage and not call upon it until it became absolutely necessary to ensure whatever it was you were trying to accomplish on that day or at that event. So for them to get just a, a little bit better at the end uh, was, uh, I don't want to say that we, we, we caused that to be orchestrated, but it was something we were waiting to see. Uh, the victory there was going to be very important for them, so we pretty much think that, that we got them to show all, all that they did have from a performance standpoint, and that's important to do. You know, a, a, any manufacturer that's participating in this series knows the importance of the 24 hours of Le Mans, and so now you got three events that lead up to that. It probably wouldn't be advisable if you thought you had a great car to go out there and during the course of those three events just show your full hand knowing full well at any given moment they could come in and say, you know what, you're going too fast, we're going to take uh, four tenths of restrictor away from you, or we're going to do something else, we're going to put 20 kilos on you. Probably wouldn't be advisable to do that before you get to Le Mans. So I think all the manufacturers may have, you know, just kind of played it by ear a little bit, managed what they were doing until they get to Le Mans, and then after Le Mans all bets are off and everybody will probably be racing as hard as they can race. I'm not saying we did that. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying some manufacturers might do that. <laughs> yes, ma'am.
And we're talking about the 24 hours of the mall. Uh, I'm, I'm, well, I'm talking about the other. Oh, the yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, because you, you saw him at Seaburn. Yeah. Yeah, Danny, go ahead. Because yeah, you, you Danny, would. sanctioning body for all racing worldwide. It doesn't matter if it's the Indy 500 or the Daytona 24s or the Daytona 500. The FIA is the global sanctioning body. They, they, they kind of oversee all racing. The ACO, the Automobile Club de l'Ouest, is a sanctioning body for the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Well, they have combined forces and have created a series called the World Endurance Championship, the WEC. And this year, the WEC Championship, which I think has six or seven races in it, two of those races are Sebring and the 24 Hours of Le Mans. So at both those events, there's actually two races being run. There's a WEC winner and an ACO winner, or an American Le Mans winner. Same thing uh, at Le Mans. So Jacques Lacan, with the other Corvettes, is running that World Endurance Championship. In, and they have two categories. They have a GTE Pro and a GTE Amateur, and he runs in that amateur class. Amateur racing is huge in Europe. To be able to afford it, the manufacturers don't participate, so you got to find yourself a rich guy, and the rich guy usually isn't a professional driver. So what they've learned is they team up a rich guy with a driver, and that creates their amateur series. That's why they've done that. Here we have enough club racing to keep all the amateurs busy. And, and they don't they don't need to participate. So we have a clear line of distinction in North America. That 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 line gets changed when you go over to Europe. That's why they that's why they do that. Yeah. What 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 happens when those two races are going? They haven't determined what they're going to do. Are they going to run a split podium as they ran in Sebring, or are they going to have one overall winner? They haven't given us the answer to that yet. 
So uh, they've got a couple more months to figure it out. And by the way, they're French, so it may not be until after the race. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>